Hi guys, um, I've been compelled to make a short video response to an article I've read in The Guardian um, by a Karim, uh, Karim Bashir, uh, I believe of British Fencing, uh, talking about the new BBC series The Three Musketeers um, and the parallels between the fencing shown with rapiers in that series um, on the BBC and, uh, and sport fencing and sport fencing weapons. So the first thing I want to say is there are a couple of um, historical misnomers in that article which annoyed me and spurred me to make a video response. The first one is, uh, he states that duelling was not uh, to the death like fencing and that it was uh, usually, or he perhaps implies always, done to first blood. This is absolutely incorrect. There were first blood duels. Uh, in various periods, in various places, at various times. Um, but uh, the majority of duels that are documented and that the historical fencing treatises uh, from the period of the rapier uh, deal with seem to have been to the death. Um, if you look at any of the surviving historical treatises, uh, Fabrice, Capoferro, uh, De Grassi, um, Alfieri, whichever ones you want to look at that deal with the rapier, uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, they uh, predominantly are talking about techniques that result in your opponent either dying or being utterly incapacitated or mortally wounded. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is, um, I think, an urban myth that goes around in the sport fencing community, that sabre uh, comes from the cavalry weapon. First of all, sport fencing sabre does not come from the cavalry weapon, it comes from the infantry officer's sabre, i.e. the sword of the officer who fights on foot. It is a foot sabre. It is, uh, the modern sport weapon is straight uh, and is incredibly light. Uh, it is usually less than 400 grams. Uh, a, an infantry officer's sabre weighs 800 grams and in historical fencing the uh, pretty much the lightest um, sabres that we use are 800 grams. That is at least twice as heavy as a sport fencing sabre. And cavalry sabres are heavier than that even. They are more like 900 to 1000 grams. Uh, and cavalry sabres are usually curved. Not always, they can be straight, um, but they are longer and bigger. And of course they are used on a horse. And uh, I have sport fence uh, at school and at university, um, and I know many sport fencers, and I have a lot of time for sport fencing, as I've said in previous videos, and I think it's a great sport. Um, however, sport fencing sabre and uh, foil and epee as well are very different, different to the historical use of the weapons because of the rules that they use. There is no right of way in historical or real fencing. Uh, the weapons are heavier. A single touch will not necessarily fell your opponent. Um, poking them uh, with a foil is very different to running someone through with a rapier or a, a small sword or a spadru. Um, and uh, the other thing that's mentioned in regards to um, sport fencing sabres often is, oh, the legs are out of bounds because it's a cavalry weapon. In, in, on what uh, planet, in what universe does that make sense? Horses were a valid target in warfare, as were a person's legs. You don't cease to have legs when you sit on a saddle. Um, very clearly if you read any of the cavalry manuals, and there are many of them surviving from Le Marchand in, in uh, 1796, right the way through all the British regulation cavalry um, manuals, for example Angelo's in 1819, uh, through Greenwood 1840 and so on and so on, um, they all have full body target. They target any part of the opponent because of course that's what makes sense. You want to kill the other person or incapacitate them. Um, the reason that legs are off target in sports saber is purely a, an artificial um, uh, factor of the rule sets that were introduced in the early 20th century. Prior to that, Sabre fencing on foot allowed the targeting of legs, and in fact, they wore padded leg protectors, sometimes cricket leg pads, uh, to protect their knees and shins from these leg hits. And any of you who go and search for 19th century military sabre fencing will see in the original uh, illustrations of, of, and paintings of, of this type of fencing, and equally with bayonet, they wear leg protectors and a skirt sometimes for this very reason. Um, to protect their groins and legs. Um, 
And the last point I want to make really is that if what really excites you is the uh, rapier fencing in The Three Musketeers and you think that you want to have a go at that, that's fantastic. Do! Why don't you go to a rapier school? I would not recommend, if what you really want to learn is rapier fighting, to go to a sport fencing club because foil, epee and sabre are really very different to um, rapier fencing and there are rapier fencing schools out there. There are rapier fencing schools in London, there are rapier fencing schools in Surrey, there are rapier fencing schools in York, in, uh, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow. So you can, find, you can find a school to learn how to use a rapier almost certainly within driving distance of where you live. And equally, if there are other types of historical weapons you want to learn how to use, long sword, sabre, sword and buckler, sword and shield, there are schools that teach that. Um, so, if you want to learn historical fencing, have a look online for historical fencing in the UK. Um, the British Federation for Historical Swordplay is one organisation representing some of the UK clubs and there are other organisations out there, HEMAC and so on, that represent historical fencing also. Thank you.